Hello, everybody. Wait, one, two. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Uh, when you're ready, we will announce our wonderful cast. Rosencrantz will be played by Gabby Grice. Hey! Guildenstern will be played by Tori Urquhart. Correct me if I'm here. Yep. Ophelia will be Erin Eldershaw. Ophelia? Uh, we will get back to that. Um, Claudius will be Christopher Prentice. Hello. Uh, Gertrude will be Susan Bond. Hello. Our Hamlet is Miriam Bachman. Hello. Our Polonius is Nick Norcampos. Nice to be back, everybody. And again, special shout out to my Christine, also for getting me that ticket to R&J in the park tonight. <laughs> it was awesome. Our player is Mo Kamali. Hello, hello. Our player king is Mark Crater. Hey, guys. Our soldier is Shailen Bass McFall. Did I pronounce that correctly? Shailen Bass McFall. Shailen Bass McFall. Like the fish. Hello. Yeah. Our ambassador is Melissa Wright. Hi. Our Horatio is Nicole Falgu. Hello. And do we have our Ophelia? Do we have our Ophelia? We saw her earlier. Let's see. Uh, she said in the chat her mic went all whack. Oh. Like all right. two minutes ago, she said, sorry, friends, my audio went all W-A-K-C, which I'm going to assume means whack. All right. So would we be okay with starting and someone keep an, an eye on the pages to uh, let her know where we are? Uh, or would you like to? I'm having a problem with my audio. I can't hear anyone. Apologies. Trying to fix now. In yeah, the okay. So I think we could probably start without Ophelia. And okay. if we get there and we can't hear her, um, who is not reading a lot? Who doesn't have a lot of lines? Shout. Technically me. Or Shay. Okay. Melissa, why don't you take Ophelia if Aaron doesn't make it back? Okay, I'll type that in the chat because she's saying she can't hear anything. Okay, but if she makes it back, she can have it. Okay. Okay, so you get the thankless roll. <laughs> All right. Uh, and now that we're, uh, let's begin with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Act one. Two Elizabethans passing the time in a place without any visible character. They are well-dressed. Hats, cloaks, sticks, and all. Each of them has a large leather money bag. Gildenstern's bag is nearly empty. Rosencrantz's bag is nearly full. The reason being, they are betting on the toss of a coin in the following manner. Gildenstern, hereafter, Gil, takes a coin out of his bag, spins it, letting it fall. Rosencrantz, hereafter Roz, studies it, announces it as heads, as it happens, and puts it into his own bag. Then they repeat the process. They have apparently been doing this for some time. The run of heads is impossible, yet Roz betray betrays no surprise at all. He feels none. However, he is nice enough to feel a little embarrassed at taking so much money off his friend. Let that be his character note. Gil is well alive to the oddity of it. He's not worried about the money, but he is worried by the implications, aware, but not going to panic about it. His character note. Gil sits. Roz stands. He does the moving, retrieving coins. Gil spins. Roz studies coin. Heads. Picks it up, puts it in his bag, process is repeated. Heads. Again. Heads. Again. Heads. Again. Heads. 
No, it can be done by luck alone. What? There is an art of building up its suspense. No, it can be done by luck alone. Heads. If that's the word I'm after. <laughs> 76, love. Gil gets up, but has nowhere to go. He spins another coin over his shoulder without looking at it, his attention being directed at his environment or lack of it. Heads. A weaker man might be moved to re-examine his faith if in nothing else, at least in the law of probability. He flips a coin over his shoulder as he goes to look upstage. Heads. Gil, examining the confines of the stage, flips over two more coins. As he does so, one by one, of course. Rouz announces each of them as... Heads. The law of probability, it has been oddly asserted, is something to do with the proposition that if six monkeys... If six monkeys were... Gay? Were they? Are you? Game. The law of averages, if I have got this right, means that if six monkeys were thrown up in the air for long enough, they would land on their tails about as often as they would land on their heads. Which even at first glance does not strike one as a particularly rewarding speculation in either sense, even without the monkeys. I mean, you wouldn't bet on it. I mean, I would, but you wouldn't. Heads. Would you? Heads. Heads. Getting a bit of a bore, isn't it? Bore? Well... What about the suspense? What suspense? It must be a, the law of diminishing returns. I feel the spell is about to be broken. He takes out a coin, spins it high, Catches it over on to the back of his other hand, steadies the coin, and tosses it to Roz. His energy deflates, and he sits. Well, it was an even chance, if my calculations are correct. 85 in a row! Beating the record. Don't be absurd. Easily! Is that it, then? Is that all? What? A new record? Is that as far as you are prepared to go? Well... No questions, not, not even a pause. You spun them yourself. Not a flicker of doubt? Well, I won, didn't I? And if you'd lost, if they'd come down against you 85 times, one after another, just like that. 85 in a row tails? Yes. What would you think? Well, well, I'd have a good look at your coins for a start. Relieved. At least we can still count on self-interest as a predictable factor. It's the last to go. Your capacity for trust made me wonder if perhaps you, Alone. Touch. Roz claps his hand. Gil pulls him up more intensely. We have been spinning coins together since. Releases him almost as violently. This is not the first time we have spun coins. Oh, no. We've been spinning coins for as long as I remember. How long is that? Yet. Mind you, 85 times! Yes. 
It'll take some beating, I imagine. Is that what you imagine? Is that it? No fear? Fear? Fear! The, the crack that might flood your brain with light! Heads. He puts it in his bag. Gil sits despondently. He takes a coin, spins it, lets it fall between his feet. He looks at it, picks it up, throws it to Roz, who puts it in his bag. Gil takes another coin, spins it, catches it, turns it over onto his other hand, looks at it, and throws it to Roz, who puts it in his bag. Gil takes a third coin, spins it, catches it in his right hand, turns it over on his left, left wrist, lobs it in the air, catches it with his left hand, raises his left leg, throws the coin up under it, catches it, and turns it over onto the top of his head where it sits. Ross comes, look at it, puts it in his bag. I'm afraid. So am I. I'm afraid it isn't your day. I'm afraid it is. 89. It must be indicative of something besides the redistribution of wealth. List of possible explanations. One, I'm willing. it. Inside where nothing shows, I am the essence of a man spinning double-headed coins and betting against himself in private atonement for an unremembered past. Heads. Two, time has stopped dead, and the single experiences of one coin being spun once has been repeated 90 times. <sighs> On the whole, doubtful. Three, divine intervention. That is to say, a good turn from above concerning him, I compared with children of Israel or retribution from above concerning me, compared with Lot's wife. Four, a spectacular vindication of the principle that each individual coin spun individually. He spins one. As likely to come down heads as tails and therefore should cause no surprise each individual time it does. It does. He tosses it to Roz. I've never known anything like it. And a syllogism. One, he had never known anything like it. Two, he has never known anything to write home about. Three, it is nothing to write home about. Uh, hmm. What's the first thing you remember? Oh. Let's see. The first thing that comes into my head, you mean? No, the first thing you remember. Ah. No, it's no good. It's gone. It was a long time ago. You don't get my meaning. What is the first thing after all the things you've forgotten? Oh, I see. I've forgotten the question. Are you happy? What? Content? At ease? I suppose so. What are you going to do now? I don't know. What do you want to do? I have no desires. None. There was a messenger. That's right. We were sent for. Syllogism the second. One. Probability is a factor which operates within natural forces. Two, probability is not operating as a factor. Three, we are now within un-sub or supernatural forces. Discuss. Not too heatedly. I'm sorry, I... What's the matter with you? Scientific approach to the examination of phenomena is a defense against the pure emotion of fear. Keep tight hold and continue while there's time. Now, uh, counter to the previous syllogism. 
tricky one. Follow me carefully. It, it, it may prove a comfort. If we postulate, and we just have, that within unsub or supernatural forces, the probability is that the law of probability will not operate as a factor, then we must accept that the probability of the first part will not operate as a factor, in which case the law of probability will operate as a factor within unsub or supernatural forces. And since it obviously hasn't been doing so, we can take it that we are not held within on sub or supernatural forces after all, in all probability that is, which is a great relief to me personally, which is all very well, except that <laughs> we have been spinning coins together since I don't know when, and in all that time, if it is all that time, I don't suppose either of us was more than a couple of gold pieces up or down. I hope that doesn't sound surprising because it is very unsurprising. This, this, it, it is this, it's very unsurprising. This is something I am trying to keep hold of. The equanimity of your average tosser of coins depends on the law or or rather a tendency or let us let us say a, a probability or at any rate a mathematically calcul calculable chance which ensures that he will not upset himself by losing too much or nor upset his opponent by winning too often this made for a kind of harmony and a kind of confidence it related the fortuitous and the it related the fortuitous and ordained into a reassuring union which we recognized as nature. The sun came up about as often as it went down in the long run and a, a coin showed heads about as often as it showed tails. Then a messenger arrived. We had been sent for, nothing else happened. 92 coins spun consecutively have come down heads 92 consecutive times. And for the last three minutes on the wind of a windless day, I have heard the sounds of drums and flute. Ross is cutting his fingernails. Another curious scientific phenomenon is the fact that uh, the fingernail grows after death, as does the beard. What? Beard! But you're not dead. I didn't say they started to grow after death. The fingernails also grow before birth, though not the beard. What? Beard! What's the matter with you? The toenails, on the other hand, never grow at all. The toenails, on the other hand, never grow at all. Do they? It's a funny thing. I cut my fingernails all the time, and every time I think to cut them, they need cutting. Now, for instance, and yet I never, to the best of my knowledge, cut my toenails. They ought to be curled under my feet by now, but it doesn't happen. I never think about them. Perhaps I cut them absentmindedly when I'm thinking of something else. Do you remember the first thing that happened today? I woke up. I suppose. Oh, I've got it now. That man, a foreigner, he woke us up. A messenger. That's it. Pale sky before dawn, a man standing on his saddle to bang on the shutters, shouts, what's all the row about? Clear off! But then he called our names. You remember that? This man woke us up. Yes. We were sent for. Yes. That's why we're here. Traveling. Yes. It was urgent. A matter of extreme urgency. A royal summons. His very words. Official business and no questions asked. Lights in the stable yard. Saddle up and off headlong and hot foot across the land. Our guides outstripped in breakneck pursuit of our duty. Fearful lest we come too late. Too late for what? How do I know? We haven't got there yet. What are we doing here? I, I ask myself. You might well ask. You better get on. You might well think. You better get on. Right. On where? Forward. 
Ah. Which way do we... Um, which, which way do we... Starting from scratch. An awakening. A man standing on his saddle to bang on the shutters. Our names shouted in a certain dawn. A message, a summons, a new, rec a new record for heads and tails. Hmm. We have not been picked out simply to be abandoned. Let loose to find our own way. We are entitled to some direction. I, I would have thought. I say, I say. Yes. I can hear. Oh, I thought I heard music. Yes. Like a band. <laughs> it sounded, it sounded like a band, drums. Yes. It couldn't have been real. The colors red, blue, and green are real. The color yellow is a mystical experience shared by everyone. It must have been thunder. Like drums. By the end of the next speech, the band is faintly audible. A man breaking his journey between one place and another at a third place of no name, character, population, or significance sees a unicorn cross his path and disappear. That in itself is startling, but there are precedents for mys mystical encounters of various kinds or, to be less extreme, a, a choice of persuasions to put it down to fancy until, my God, says the second man, I must be dreaming. I thought I saw a unicorn. At which point a dimension is added that makes the experience as alarming as it will ever be. A third witness, you understand, adds no further dimension but only spreads it thinner. And a fourth, thinner still, and the more witnesses there are, the thinner it gets and the more reasonable it becomes until it is as thin as reality, the name we give the common experience. Look, look, recites the crowd, a horse with an arrow in its forehead. It must have been mistaken for a deer. I knew all along it was a band. All along it was a band. Here they come! At the last moment before they enter. I'm sorry it wasn't a unicorn. I, it would have been nice to have unicorns. The tragedians are six in number, including a small boy, Alfred. Two pull and push a cart filled with props and belongings. There's also a drummer, a horn player, and a flautist. The spokesman, the player, has no instrument. He brings up the rear and is the first to notice them. Halt! The group turns and halts. An audience. Ross and Gills half rise. D don't move. Perfect. Perfect. A lucky thing we came along. For us? <laughs> Let us hope so. But to meet two gentlemen on the road, we would not hope to meet them often. No? <laughs> well, Mets, in fact. And just in time. Why is that? Why? We grow rusty. And you catch us at the very point of decadence. By this time tomorrow, we might have forgotten everything we ever knew. That's a thought, isn't it? <laughs> We'd be back to where we started. Improvising. Tumblers, are you? <laughs> We can give you a tumble, if that's your taste, and times being what they are. Otherwise, for a jingle of coin, we can do you a selection of gory romances full of fine cadence and corpses, pirated from the Italian. And it doesn't take much to make a jingle. Even a single coin has music in it. They all flourish and bow raggedly. Tragedians, at your command. My what? name is Gildenstern. That can't be right. No, yes, my name is Gildenstern. My name is Gildenstern, and that is Rosenkrantz. <clears throat> oh, right, okay. No, I'm sorry. 
His name's Gildenstern, and I'm Rosencrantz. A pleasure. We've uh, played to bigger, of course, but quality counts for something. I recognized you at once. And who are we? As fellow artists. I thought we were gentlemen. For some of us, it is performance. For others, patronage. They are two sides of the same coin. Or let us say, being as that there are so many of us, the same side of two coins. Hmm? That was again. Don't clap too loudly. It's a very old world. What is your line? Try to be, sir. Deaths and disclosures, universal and particular, denouements both unexpected and exorable, transvestite melodrama on all levels, including the suggestive. We transport you into a world of intrigue and illusion. Clowns, if you like, uh, murderers. We, we can do you ghosts and battles on the skirmish level, heroes, villains, tormented lovers, set pieces in the poetic vein. We can do you rapiers or rape or both by all means, faithless wives and ravished virgins, flagrant delicto at a price, but that comes under realism for which there are special terms. Getting warm, am I? Well, I don't know. It costs little to watch and little more if you happen to get caught up in the action, if that's your taste and times being what they are. What are they? Indifferent. Bad? <laughs> Wicked. Now, what precisely is your pleasure? He turns to the tragedians. Gentlemen, disport yourselves. The Tragedians shuffle into some kind of line. There. Be anything you like. What do they do? Let your imagination run riot. They are beyond surprise. And how much? To take part? To watch. Watch what? A private performance. How private? Well, there are only two of us. Is that enough? For an audience, disappointing. But for, for yours, about average. What's the difference? Ten guilders. Ten guilders? I mean eight. Together? Uh, each. I don't think you understand. What are you saying? What am I saying? Um, seven. Where have you been? roundabout a nest of children carries the custom of the town juvenile companies they are the fashion but they cannot match our repertoire well we'll stoop to anything if that's your bent they'll grow up now nah, there's one born every minute onward the, Trid the Tridians start to resume their burdens and their journey. Gil stirs himself at last. Where are you going? Huh? Out! They halt and turn. Home, sir. Where from? Home. We're traveling people. We take our chances where we find them. It was chance, then. So chance? You found us. Oh, yes. You were looking? Oh, uh, no. Chance, then. Or fate. Yours or ours. It could hardly be one without the other. Fate, then. Oh, yes. We have no control. Tonight, we play to the court. Or the night after. Or to the tavern. Or not. Perhaps I can use my influence. At the tavern? At the court. I would say I have some influence. Would you say so? I have influence yet. 
Y yes, what? Gil sees I have influence. Gil listens his hold more calmly. You said something about getting caught up in in the action. <laughs> I did, I did. You're quicker than your friend. Now, for a handful of guilders, I happen to have a private and uncut performance of the rape of the Sabian woman, or rather woman, or rather Alfred. Oh, get, get your skirt on, Alfred. The boy starts struggling into a female robe. And for eight, you can participate. Taking either part or both for 10. With encores. Gil smashes the player across the face. The player recoils. Gil starts trembling. Get your skirt off, Alfred. Alfred struggles out of his half on robe. Could have been. It didn't have to be obscene. It could have been a bird out of season dropping bright feathered on my shoulder. It could have been a tongueless dwarf standing by the road to point the way. I was prepared. But it's this, is it? No enigma. No dignity, nothing classical, portentous, only this, a comic pornographer and a rabble of prostitutes. Bowing sadly. You should have caught us in better times. We were purists then. <clears throat> Onward. The players make to leave. Excuse me. Halt. They halt. Mm -hmm. Alfred! Alfred resumes the struggle. The player comes forward. You're not, uh, exclusively players, then? We're inclusively players, sir. So, <clears throat> you give exhibitions? Mm, performances, sir. Yes, of course. There's more money in that, is there? There is more trade. Times being what they are. Yes. Indifferent. Completely. You know, I've no idea. No. I mean, I've heard of, but I've never actually... No. I mean, what exactly do you do? We keep to our usual stuff, more or less. Only inside out. We do on stage the things that are supposed to happen off. Which is a kind of integrity if you look on every exit being an entrance somewhere else well i'm not really the type of man who no but uh, don't hurry off sit down and tell us about some of the things people ask you to do player turns away onward just a minute they turn well, well all right, I wouldn't mind seeing just an idea of the kind of, what will you do for that? Tosses a single coin on the ground between them. The player spits at the coin from where he stands. The tragedians demure, trying to get at the coin. He kicks and cups them back. On. Alfred is still half in and out of his robe. The player cups him to Alfred. What are you playing at? Rouse is shamed into fury. Filth! Disgusting! I'll report you to the authorities, perverts! I know your game, all right! It's all filth! The players are about to leave. Gil has remained detached. Do you like a bet? Tragedians <clears throat> turn and look interested. The player comes forward. What kind of bet do you have in mind? Gil walks half the distance toward the player, stops with his foot over the coin. Double or quits? Well, heads. Gil raises his foot. The player bends. The tragedians 
Cap crowd around. Relief and congratulations. The player picks up the coin. Gil throws him a second coin. Again? Some of the Tragedians are for it, others against. Evens. Player nods, tosses the coin. Heads. It is. He picks it up. Again. Gil spins coin. Heads. It is. The player picks up coin. He has two coins again. He spins one. Heads. It is. Gil picks it up, then tosses it immediately. Tails. But it's heads. Gil picks it up. The player tosses down his last coin by way of paying up and turns away. Gil doesn't pick it up. He puts his foot on it. Heads. No. Pause. The Tridians are against this, apologetically. They don't like the odds. Gil lifts his foot, squats, picks up the coin, still squatting, looks up. You were right. Heads. Spins it, slaps his hand on it on the floor. Heads, I win. No. Gil uncovers the coin. Right again. Heads, I win. No. Uncovers the coin. And right again. Heads, I win. No. He turns away the tragedians with him. Gil stands up, comes close. Would you believe it? Bet me the year of my birth doubled is an odd number. Your birth? If you don't trust me, don't bet with me. Why would you trust me? Bet me then. My birth. Odd numbers you win. You're on. The tragedians have come forward wide awake. Good. Year of your birth, double it. Even numbers I win, odd numbers I lose. Silence. An awful sign as the tragedians realize that any numbered doubled is even. Then a terrible row as they object. Then a terrible silence. We have no money. Gil oh. tells him. Then what have you got? The player silently brings Alfred forward. Gil regards Alfred sadly. Was it for this? It, it is the best we've got. And the times are bad indeed. The player starts to speak, protestation, but Gil turns on him viciously. The very air stinks. The player moves back. Gil moves down to the footlights and turns. Come here, Alfred. Alfred moves down and stands, frightened and small, gently. Do you lose often? Uh, yes, sir. Then what could you have left to lose? Nothing, sir. Do you like being an actor? No, sir. You and I, Alfred, we could create a dramatic precedent here. And Alfred, who has been near to tears, starts to sniffle. Come, come, Alfred. This is no way to fill the theaters of Europe. The player has moved down to remonstrate with Alfred. Gil cuts him off again, viciously. Do you know any good plays? Plays? Uh, exhibitions. I thought you said you were actors. Oh, oh well, we are. But we are. But there hasn't been much call. You lost. Well then, one of the Greeks, perhaps? You're familiar with the tragedies of antiquity, are you? The great homicidal classics, 
Maitri, Petri, Fratri, Sorori, Uxori, and it goes without saying. Saucy. Suicidal. Hmm? Maidens aspiring to godheads. And vice versa. Your kind of thing, is it? Uh, well, no. I can't say it is, really. We're more of the blood, love, and rhetoric school. Well, I'll leave the choice to you if there is anything to choose between them. <laughs> They're hardly <laughs> divisible, sir. Well, <clears throat> I can do you blood and love without the rhetoric. I can do you blood and rhetoric without the love. And I can do you all three concurrent or consecutive, but I can't do you love and rhetoric without the blood. Blood is compuls compulsory. They're, they're all blood, you see. Is that what people want? It's what we do. He turns away. Gil touches Alfred on the shoulder. Thank you. We'll let you know. The player is moved upstage. Alfred follows. 38. Position? Sir? One of your tableau? Uh, no, sir. Oh. To the Tragedians now departing with their cart, already taking various props off it. Entrances. There. And there. Indicating upstage. The player has not moved his position for his last four lines. He does not move now. Gil waits. Well, aren't you going to change into your costume? I uh, never change out of it, sir. Always in character. That's, that's it. Aren't you going to come on? I am on. But if you are on, you can't come on, can you? I start on. But it hasn't started. But go on, we'll, we'll look out for you. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a wave. He does not move. His immobility is now pointed and getting awkward. Pause. Roz walks up to him till they are face to face. Excuse me. Pause. The player lifts his downstage foot. It was covering Gil's coin. Roz puts his foot on the coin. Smiles. Thank you. The player turns and goes. Roz is bent for the coin. Come on. I say, that was lucky. What? It was tails. He tosses the coin to Gil, who catches it. Simultaneously, a lighting change sufficient to alter the exterior mood into interior, but nothing violent. And Ophelia runs on in some alarm holding up her skirts, followed by Hamlet. Ophelia has been sewing, and she holds the garment. They are both mute. Hamlet with his doublet all embraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled and gartered and down to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking each other, and with a look so piteous, he takes her by the wrist and holds her hard. Then he goes to the length of his arm, and with his other hand over his brow, falls to such perusal of her face as he would draw it. At last, with a little shaking of his arm and thrice his head waving up and down, he raises a sigh so piteous and profound that it does seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. That done, he lets her go and with his head over his shoulder, turned, he goes out backwards without taking his eyes off her. She runs off in the opposite direction. Roz and Gil have frozen. Gil unfreezes first. He jumps at Roz. Come on! But a flourish! Enter Claudius and Gertrude attended. Welcome! 
Dear Rosencrantz. He raises a hand at Gil where Ross bows. Gil bows late and hurriedly. And Gildenstern. He raises a hand at Ross while Gil bows to him. Ross is still straightening up from his previous bow, and halfway up he bows down again. With his head down, he twists to look at Gil, who is on the way up. Moreover, that we did much long to see you, the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Ross and Gil still adjusting their clothing. Clothing. Claudius's presence. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation? So call it. Nor is the man nor an exterior nor an inward man resembles that it was. What it should be more than his father's death that thus hath put him so much from the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. I entreat you both that being of so young days brought up with him and sith so neighborhood, neighbored, to his youth and behavior, that you vouchsafe your rest here in our court some little time. So by your companies to draw him on to pleasures, and to gather so much as from occasion you may glean, whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus, that opened lies within our remedy. Gentlemen. They both bow. He hath much talked of you, and sure I am there two men there is not living to whom he more adheres. If it will please you to show us so much gentry and goodwill as to expend your time with us a while for the supply and profit of our hope, your visitation shall receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Both your majesties might, by the sovereign power you have of us, put your dread pleasures more into command than to entreaty. We both obey and here give up ourselves in the full bent to lay our service freely at your feet to be commanded. Thanks, Rosencrantz. And gentle Gildenstern. Thanks, Gildenstern. Turning to Ross, who bows as Gil checks upward movements to bow to, both bent double, squinting at each other. And gentle Rosencrantz. Both straightening up, Gil checks again and bows again. And I beseech you instantly to visit my too much changed son. Go, some of you, and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. Two attendants exit backwards, indicating that Roz and Gil should follow. Heaven make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him. Aye, amen. Roz and Gil move towards a downstage wing. Before they get there, Polonius enters. They stop and bow to him. He nods and hurries upstage to Claudius. They turn to look at him. The ambassadors from Norway, my good lord, are joyfully returned. Thou still hast been the father of good news. Have I, my lord? Assure you, my good liege, I hold my duty as I hold my soul, both to my god and to my gracious king. And I do think, or else this brain of mine, uns not the trail of policy, so sure as it used to do, I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Exunt, leaving Roz and Gil. I want to go home. Don't let them confuse you. I'm out of my step here. Listen, being home and hide, dry and ho home, I'll, um... It's all over, my depths. I'll hide you home and... Out of my head! Dry you high and... Over my step, over my dead body! I tell you, it's all stopping to a death, it's boating to a death, stepping to a head, it's all heading to a dead stop. The nursemaid? And we'll soon be home and high and dry and high and dry, high and dry. <laughs> Has it ever happened to you that all of a sudden and there, and for no reason at all, you haven't the faintest idea of how to spell the word wife? or house because when you write it down you just can't remember ever having seen those letters in that order before i remember yes i remember when there were no questions there were always questions to exchange one set for another is no great matter answers yes there were answers to everything I've forgotten 
I haven't forgotten how I used to remember my own name and yours. Yes. There were answers everywhere you looked. There was no question about it. People knew who I was, and if they didn't, they asked, and I told them. You did. The trouble is, each of them is plausible without being instinctive. All your life you live so close to truth, it becomes a permanent blur in the corner of your eye. And when something nudges it into outline, it is like being ambushed by a grotesque. A man standing in his saddle in the half-lit, half-alive dawn banged on the shutters and called two names. He was just a hat and a cloak levitating in the gray plume of his own breath. But when he called, we came. That much is certain, we came. Well, I can tell you, I'm sick to death of it. I don't care one way or another, so why don't you make up your mind? We can't afford anything quite so arbitrary. Nor did we come all this way for a christening. How did that preceded us? But we are comparatively fortunate. We might have been left to sift the whole field of human nomenclature like two blind men looting a bazaar, a, a bazaar for their own portraits. At least we are presented with alternatives. Well, as from now. But not choice. You made me look ridiculous in there. I looked just as ridiculous as you did. Consistency is all I ask! What they say on a daily mask. I want to go home! Which way did we come in? I've lost my sense of direction. The only beginning is birth and the only end is death. If you can't count on that, what can you count on? They connect again. We don't owe anything to anyone. You've been caught up. Your smallest action sets off another somewhere else and is set off by it. Keep an eye open, an ear cocked, tread warily, follow instructions. We'll be all right. For how long? The events have played themselves out. There's a logic at work. It's all done for you, don't worry. Enjoy it, relax. To be taken in hand and led like being a child again, even without the innocence. A child, it's like being given a prize. An extra slice of childhood when you least expect it as a prize for being good or, or compensation for never having had one. Do I come to this myself? I can't remember. What have we got to go on? You've been briefed. Hamlet's transform transformation. What do you recollect? Well, he's changed, hasn't he? The exterior and inward man fails to resemble... Draw him on to pleasures. Glean what afflicts him. Something more than his father's death. Who are we talking about us? There aren't two people living whom he dotes on more than us. <laughs> we, we cheer him up. Find out what's the matter. Exactly. It's a matter of asking the right questions and giving away as little as we can. <laughs> it's a game. And then we go. And receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Oh, I like the sound of that. What do you think he means by remembrance? He doesn't forget his friends. Would you care to estimate? Difficult to say, really. Some kings tend to be amnesiac. Others, I suppose, the opposite, whatever that is. Yes, but... Elephant time? Not how long, how much. Retentive. He's a very retentive king, a, a royal retainer. What are you playing at? Words, words. Well, we have to go on. Shouldn't we be doing something... Constructive? What did you have in mind? A short, blunt, human pyramid? We could go. Where? After him. Why? They've got us placed now. If we start moving around, we'll, we'll all be chasing each other all night. Hiatus. How very intriguing. I feel like a spectator, an appalling prospect. 
The only thing that makes it bearable is the irrational belief that somebody interesting will come on in a minute. The anyone? No. You? No. Fine persecution. To be kept intrigued without ever quite being enlightened. We've had no practice. We can play at questions. What good would that do? Practice! Statement. One love. Cheating. How? I hadn't started yet. Statement. Two love. Are you counting that? What? Are you counting that? Bell. No repetitions. Three love. First game to- I'm not gonna play if you're gonna be like that. Who serve? Huh? Foul. No grunts. Love one. Who's go? Why? Why not? What for? Foul. No synonyms. One all. What in God's name is going on? Foul. No rhetoric. Two one. What does it all add up to? Can't you guess? Were you addressing me? Is there anyone else? Who? How would I know? Why do you ask? Are you serious? Is that rhetoric? No. Statement. To all. Game point. What's the matter with you today? When? What? Are you deaf? Am I dead? Yes or no? Is there a choice? Is there a god? Foul! No non sequiturs. Three, two, one game all. What's your name? What's yours? I ask first. Statement. One love. What's your name when you're at home? What's yours? When I'm at home? Is it different at home? What home? Haven't you got one? Why do you ask? What are you driving at? What's your name? Repetition. To love. Match point to me. Who do you think you are? Rhetoric. Game and match. Where is it going to end? That's the question. It's all questions. Do you think it matters? Doesn't it matter to you? Why should it matter? What does it matter why? Doesn't it matter why it matters? What's the matter with you? It doesn't matter. What's the game? Enter Hamlet, behind crossing the stage, reading a book. As he is about to disappear, Gil notices him. Rosencrantz. What? Hamlet goes. Triumph, draw, triumph dawns on them. They smile. There! How was that? Clever. Natural? Instinctive. Got it in your head. I take my hat off to you. Shake hands. They do. Now I'll try you, Gil. Ah, 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 ah. Not yet. Catch me unawares. Right. They separate, pause, beside to Gil. Ready? Stupid. Sorry. Gildenstern. What? Consistency is all I ask. Immortality is all I seek. Give us this day our daily week. Who was that? Did you know him? Well, he didn't know me. He didn't see you. I didn't see him. You shall see. I hardly knew him. He's changed. You could see that? How do you know? He's sliding out. I see. He's not himself. He's changed. I can see that. Glean what afflicts him. Me? Him. How? Question and answer. Old ways are the best ways. He's afflicted. New question, I'll answer. He's not himself, you know. I'm him, you see. Who am I then? You're yourself. 
and he's you. Not a bit of it. Are you afflicted? That's the idea. <laughs> Are you ready? Let's go back a bit. I'm afflicted. I see. Lean what afflicts me. Right. Question and answer. How should I begin? Address me. My dear Gildenstern. Forgotten, haven't you? My dear Rosencrantz. I don't think you quite understand. What we are attempting is a hypothesis in which I answer for him while you ask me questions. Ah! Uh, ready? You know what to do? What? Are you stupid? Pardon? Are you deaf? Did you speak? Not now. Statement. Not now. <laughs> If I had any doubts, or rather hopes, they are dispelled. What could we possibly have in common except our situation? They separate and sit. Perhaps they'll come back this way. Should we go? Why? Rao starts up and snaps fingers. Oh, uh, you mean you pretend to be him and I ask you questions. Very good. You had me confused. I could see I had. How should I begin? Address me. They stand and face each other, posing. My honored lord. My dear Rosencrantz. Am I pretending to be you then? Certainly not, if you like. Shall we continue? Question and answer. Right. Right. My honored lord. My dear fellow. How are you? Afflicted. Really? In what way? Transformed. Inside or out? Both. I see. Not much new there. Go into details, delve, probe the background, establish the situation. So, so your uncle is the king of Denmark? And my father before him. His father before him? No, my father before him. But surely, I don't ask. Let me get it straight. Your father was king. You were his only son, your father dies, you are of age, your uncle becomes king. Yes. Unorthodox. I did me. Undeniable. Where were you? Germany. Usurpation then. Lifted in. Which reminds me. Good. I don't want to be personal. Common knowledge. Your mother's marriage. Lifted in. His body was still warm. Extraordinary. Ooh, Hasty. Vicious. It makes you think. I haven't thought about it. And with her husband's brother. We were close. She went to him. Too close. For comfort. It was bad. It adds up. Incest to adultery. Would you go so far? Never. To sum up, your father, whom you love, dies. You are his heir. You come back to find that hardly was the corpse cold before his young brother popped onto his throne and into his sheets, thereby offending both legal and natural practice. Now, why exactly are you behaving in this extraordinary manner? I can't imagine. All that is well known, common, common property. That he sent for us, and we did come. I say, I heard music. Like a band. I thought I heard a band. Rosencrantz. What? Gildenstern. What? 
don't you discriminate at all? What? Go and see if he's there. Who? There. Rouse goes to an upstage wing, looks, returns formally making his report. Yes. What is he doing? Ross repeats movement. Talking. No. Is he alone? No. Then he's not talking to himself, is he? Not by himself. Coming this way, I think. Should we go? Why? We're marked now. Hamlet enters, backwards, talking, followed by Polonius upstage. Rouse and Gill occupy the two downstage corners looking upstage. For you yourself, sir, should be as old as I am. But like a crab, you could go backward. Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave. Indeed. That's out of the air. Hmm. Hamlet crosses to upstage exit, Polonius aciding unintelligibly until... My lord, I will take my leave of you. You cannot take from me anything that I would more willingly part with all. Except my life. Except my life. Except my life. Fare you well, my lord. Oh, you go to seek the lord Hamlet. There he is. God save you, sir. Polonius goes. My honored lord. My most dear lord. Hamlet turns to them. My excellent good friends. How dost thou, Gildenstern? Coming downstage with an arm raised to Roz, Gil meanwhile bowing to no greeting. Hamlet corrects himself still to Roz. Uh, Rosencrantz. <laughs> Laugh good naturedly. They turn upstage to walk, Hamlet in the middle, arms over each shoulder. Good lads, how do you both? Blackout. Act two. Hamlet, Roz, and Gil are talking. The continuation of the previous scene. Their conversation on the move is indecipherable at first. The first intelligible line is Hamlet's coming at the end of a short speech. See Shakespeare, Act Two, Scene Two. Blood, there is something in this more than natural, if philosophy could find it out. A flourish from the tragedian's band. There are the players. Gentlemen, you are welcome to Elsinore. Your hands, come then. He takes their hands. The appurtenance of welcome is fashion and ceremony. Let me comply with you in this garb, lest my extent to the players, which I tell you must show fairly outwards, should more appear like entertainment than yours. You are welcome. About to leave. But my uncle father and aunt mother are deceived. In what, my lord? <laughs> I am but mad north-northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a handsaw. Polonius enters as Gil turns away. They'll be with you, gentlemen. Mark you, Gildenstern. And you too. At each ear a hearer. That great baby you see there is not yet out of the swaddling house. He takes Roz upstage with him, talking together. My lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When Rossius was an actor in Rome. Uh, the actors are come hither, my lord. <laughs> buzz, buzz. Exunt Hamlet and Polonius. Rous and Gil ponder, each reluctant to speak first. Hmm? Yeah. What? I, um... Oh, I thought you... 
No. Oh. I think we can say we made some headway. You think so? I think we can say that. I think we can say he made us look ridiculous. We played it close to the chest, of course. Question and answer. Old ways are the best ways. He was scoring off us all down the line. He caught us on the wrong foot once or twice, perhaps, but I thought we gained some ground. He murdered us. He might have had the edge. 27-3. And you think he might have had the edge? He murdered us! What about our evasions? Oh, our evasions were lovely. Were you sent for, he says? My lord, we were sent for. I didn't know where to put myself. He had six rhetoricals. It was question and answer, all right. 27 questions he got out in 10 minutes and answered three. I was waiting for you to delve. When is he going to start delving, I asked myself. And two repetitions. Hardly a leading question between us. We got his symptoms, didn't we? Half of what he said meant something else, and the other half didn't mean anything at all. Thwarted ambition, a sense of grievance, that's my diagnosis. Six rhetorical and two repetition, leaving 19 of which we answered 15. And what did we get in return? He depressed. Denmark's a prison and he'd rather live in a nutshell. Some shadow play about the nature of ambition which never got down to cases, and finally one direct question which might have led somewhere and led, in fact, to his illuminating claim to tell a hawk from a handsaw. When the wind is southerly. And the weather's clear. When it isn't, he can't. He's at the mercy of the elements. Licks his finger and holds it up. Is that southerly? It doesn't look southerly. What made you think so? I didn't say I think so. It could be northerly for all I know. I, would have thought, I wouldn't have thought so. Well, if you're going to be dogmatic. Wait a minute. We came from roughly south according to a rough map. I see. Well, which way did we come in? Rough, roughly. <clears throat> in the morning, sun would be easterly. I think we can assume that. That it's morning. If it is, and the sun is over there, uh, for instance, that, <laughs> that would be northerly. On the other hand, if it is not morning and the sun is over there, that, would still be northerly. To put it another way, if we came from down there and it is morning, the sun would be up there and it is actually over there and it's still morning, we must have come up there. And if that is southerly and the sun is really over there, then it's the afternoon. However, if none of these is the case, I then I up. would... Pragmatism? Is that all you have to offer? You seem to have no conception of where we stand. You won't find the answer written down for you in the bowl of a compass. I can tell you that. Besides, you can never tell this far north. It's probably dark out there. I merely suggest that the position of the sun, if it is out, would give you a rough idea of the time. Alternatively, the clock, if it is going, would give you a rough idea of the position of the sun. I forget which you're trying to establish. I'm trying to establish the direction of the wind. There isn't any wind. Draft, 
Yes. In that case, the origin. Trace it to its source and it might give us a rough idea of the way we came in, which might give us a rough idea of south for further reference. It's coming up through the floor. He studies the floor. That can't be south, can it? It's not a direction. Lick your toe and wave it around a bit. Ross considers the distance of his foot. No, I think you'd have to lick it for me. I'm prepared to let the whole matter drop. Or I could lick yours, of course. No, thank you. I'll even wave it around for you. What in God's name is the matter with you? Just being friendly. Somebody might come in. That's what we're counting on after all, ultimately. Perhaps they've all trampled each other to death in the rush. Give them a shout. Something provocative. Intrigue them. Wheels have been set in motion, and they have their own pace, to which we are condemned. Each move is dictated by the previous one. That is the meaning of order. If we start being arbitrary, it'll just be shambles. At least, let us hope so. Because if we happen, just happen to discover or, or even suspect that our spontaneity was part of their order, we'd know that we were lost. He sits. A Chinaman of the, of the Tang Dynasty, and by which definition a philosopher, dreamed he was a butterfly. And from that moment, he was never quite sure that he was not a butterfly, dreaming it was a Chinese philosopher. Envy him in his twofold security. A good pause. Fire! Where? It's all right. I'm demonstrating the misuse of free speech to prove that it exists. Regards the audience, the audience that is the direction with contempt and other directions, then front again. Not a move. They should burn to death in their shoes. Ross takes out one of his coins. Spins it. Catches it. Looks at it. Replaces it. What was it? What? Heads or tails? Oh. I didn't look. Yes, you did. Oh. Did I? He takes out a coin. Studies it. Quite right. It rings a bell. What's the last thing you remember? I don't wish to be reminded of it. We cross our bridges when we come to them and burn them behind us with nothing to show for our progress except a memory of the smell of smoke and a presumption that once our eyes watered. Rouse approaches him holding a coin between finger and thumb. He covers it with his other hand, draws his fist apart, and holds them for Gil. Gil considers them. Indicates the left hand. Rouse opens it to show it is empty. No. Repeat process. Double bluff. Repeat process. Gil taps one hand, then the other quickly. Rouse inadvertently shows that both are empty. Rouse laughs as Gil turns up stage. Roz stops laughing, looks around his feet, pats his clothes, puzzled. Polonius breaks that up by entering upstage, followed by the tragedians and Hamlet. Boom says. Follow him, friends. We'll have a play tomorrow. Aside to the player who is the last of the tragedians. Thou hear me, old friend. Can you play the murder of Gonzago? My lord. We'll have tomorrow night. You could, for a need, study a speech of some dozen 
or 16 lines, which I would set down and insert in it, could you not? I, my lord. Very well. Follow that lord and look you, mock him not. The player, crossing downstage, notes Rose and Gil, stops. Hamlet, crossing downstage, addresses them without pause. My good friends, I'll leave you till tonight. You are welcome to Elsinore. Good, my lord. Hamlet goes. No, oh, you've caught up. Not yet, sir. Now mind your tongue, or we'll have it cut out and throw the rest of you away like a nightingale at a Roman feast. Took the very words out of my mouth. You'd be lost for words. You'd be tongue-tied. Like a mute in a monologue. Like a nightingale at a Roman feast. Your diction will go to pieces. Your lines will be cut. To dumb shows. And dramatic pauses. You'll never find your tongue. Like your lips. Just your tears. Your breakfast. You won't know the difference. There won't be any. You'll take the very words out of your mouth. So you've caught on. So you've caught up. Not yet. You left us. Oh, I'd forgotten. You performed a dramatic spectacle on the way. Yes, I'm sorry we had to miss it. Uh, we can't look each other in the face. You don't understand the humiliation of it. To be tricked out of the single assumption which makes our existence viable. That somebody is watching. The plot was two corpses gone before we caught sight of ourselves, stripped naked in the middle of nowhere and pouring ourselves down a bottomless well. Is that 38? There we were, demented children, mincing about in clothes that no one ever wore, speaking as no man ever spoke, swearing love in wigs and rhyme couplets, killing each other with wooden swords, hollow protestations of faith hurled at after empty promises of vengeance, at every gesture, every pose, vanishing into the thin, unpopulated air. We ransomed our dignity to the clouds and the uncomprehending birds listened. Don't you see, we're actors. We're the opposite of people. Think in your head now, think of the most private, secret, intimate thing you have ever done secure in the knowledge of its privacy. Rouse takes on a shifty look. Are you thinking of it? Well, I saw you do it! Rouse you never! It's a lie! He catches himself with a giggle in a vacuum and sits down again. Yeah, sure. We're actors. We pledged our identities secure in the conventions of our trade that someone would be watching. And then gradually no one was. We were caught high and dry. It was not until the murderer's long soliloquy that we were able to look around. Frozen as we were in profile, our eyes searched you out, first confidently, then hesitantly, then desperately, as each patch of turf, each log, every exposed corner in every direction proved uninhabited. And all the while, the murderous king addressed the horizon with his dreary, interminable guilt. Our heads began to move, wary as lizards. The corpse of unsullied Rosalinda peeped through his fingers. And the king faltered. Even then, habit and a stubborn trust that our audience spied upon us from behind the nearest bush forced our bodies to blunder on long after they had emptied of meaning until, like runaway carts, they dragged to a halt. No one came forward. No one shouted at us. 
a silence was unbreakable. It imposed itself upon us. It was obscene. We took off our crowns and swords and cloths of gold and moved silent on the road to Elsinore. Silence. Then Gil claps solo with slow, measured irony. Brilliantly recreated. <laughs> if these eyes could weep. Rather strong on metaphor, mind you. <clears throat> no criticism, only a matter of taste. And so here you are with a vengeance. That's a figure of speech, isn't it? Well, let's say we've made up for it for you may have no doubt whom to thank for your performance at the court. We are counting on you to take him out of himself. You are the, pleasure, the pleasures which we draw him on to... And by that I don't mean your usual filth. You can't treat royalty like people with normal perverted desires. They know nothing of that, and you know nothing of them to your mutual survival. So... Give him a good, clean show, suitable for all the family, or you can rest assured you'll be playing the tavern tonight. Or the night after. Or not. We already have an entry here, and always have had. You've played for him before? Yes, sir. And what's his bent? <laughs> Classical. Saucy. What will you play? The murder of Gonzago. Full of fine cadence and corpses. Pirated from the Italian. What's it about? It's about a king and a queen. Escapism, what else? Blood. Love and rhetoric. Yes. Where are you going? I can come and go as I please. You're evidently a man who knows his way around. I've been here before. We're still finding our feet. I should concentrate on not losing your heads. Do you speak from knowledge? Precedent. You've been here before. And I know which way the wind is blowing. Operating on two levels, are we? How clever. I expect it comes naturally to you being in the business, so to speak. The player's grave face does not change. He makes to move off again. Gil, for the second time, cuts him off. The truth is, we value our, your company for want of any other. We have been left so much to our own devices. After a while, one welcomes the uncertainty of being left to other people's. Hmm. Uncertainty is the normal state. You're nobody special. He makes to leave again. But for God's sake, what are we supposed to do? Relax. Respond. That's what people do. You can't go through life questioning your situation at every turn. but we don't know what's going on or what to do with ourselves. We, we don't know how to act. Act natural. You know why you're here at last. We only know what we're told and that's little enough. And for all we know, it isn't even true. For all anyone knows, nothing is. Everything has to be taken on trust. Truth is only that which is taken to be true. It is the currency of living. There may be nothing behind it, but it doesn't make any difference so long as it is honored. One acts on assumptions. What do you assume? Hamlet is not himself, inside, outside, or in. We have to glean what afflicts him. He doesn't give much away. Who does nowadays? He's melancholy. Melancholy? Mad. How is he mad? Uh, to Gil. How is he mad? More morose than mad, perhaps. Melancholy. Moody. He has moods. 
of moroseness? Madness. And yet, quite, for instance, he talks to himself, which might be madness. If he didn't talk sense, which he does. Which suggests the opposite. Uh, of what? I think I have it. A man talking sense to himself is no matter than a man talking nonsense not to himself. Or just as mad. Or just as mad. And he does both. So well, there you are. Stark raving sane. Um, why? <laughs> why? Exactly. Exactly what? Exactly why. Exactly why what? What? Why? Why what exactly? Why is he mad? I don't know! The old man thinks he's in love with his daughter. Good God! We're out of our depth here. Uh, no, no, no. He hasn't got a daughter. The old man thinks he's in love with his daughter. The old man is? A Hamlet. H Hamlet in love with the old man's daughter, the old man thinks. Ah! Uh, beginning to make sense. Unrequited passion. The player moves. Nobody leaves this room without a very good reason. Why not? All this strolling about is getting too arbitrary by half. I, I'm rapidly losing my grip. From now on, reason will prevail. I, I have lines to learn. Pass. The player passes into one of the wings. Roz cups his hands and shouts into the opposite one. Next! But no one comes. What did you expect? Something? Someone? Nothing. They sit, facing front. Are you hungry? No, are you? No. You remember that coin? No. I think I lost it. What coin? I don't remember exactly. Oh, that coin. Leather. I can't remember how I did it. It probably comes natural to you. Yes. I've got a showstopper there. Do it again. We can't afford it. Yes. One must think of the future. It's the normal thing. One, one is, after all, having it all the time. Now. Now. And now. It could go on forever. Well, not forever, I suppose. Do you ever think of yourself as actually dead? Lying in a box with a lid on it? No. Nor do I. Really. It's silly to be depressed by it. I mean, one thinks of it like being alive in a box. One keeps forgetting to take into account the fact that one is dead. Which should make a difference. Shouldn't it? I mean, you never know you were in a box, would you? It would be just like being asleep in a box. Not that I'd like to sleep in a box, mind you, not with any air. You'd wake up dead for a start, and then where would you be? <laughs> Apart from inside a box. That's the bit I don't like, frankly. That's that's why I don't think of it. Yell stirs restlessly, pulling his cloak around him. Because you'd be helpless, wouldn't you? Stuffed in a box like that? I mean, you'd be in there forever. Even taking into account the fact that you're dead, really. Ask yourself, if I asked you straight off, 
I'm going to stuff you in this box now. Would you rather be alive or dead? Naturally, you'd prefer to be alive. Life in a box is better than no life at all. I expect. You'd have a chance, at least. You could lie there thinking, well, at least I'm not dead. In a minute, someone's going to bang on the lid and tell me to come out. Banging on the floor with fists. Hey, you! What's your name? Come out of there! We don't have to flog it to death. I, I wouldn't think about it if I were you. You'd only get depressed. Eternity is a terrible thought. I mean, where is it going to end? Two early Christians chanced to meet in heaven. Saul of Tarsus yet, cried one. What are you doing here? Tarsus schmarsus, replied the other. I'm Paul already. He stands up restlessly and flaps his arms. Oh, they don't care. We count for nothing. We could remain silent till we're green in the face. They wouldn't come. Blue, red. A Christian, a Muslim, and a Jew chanced to meet in a closed carriage. Silverstein! cried the Jew. Who's your friend? His name's Abdullah, replied the Muslim, but he's no friend of mine since he became a convert. He leaves up again, stamps his foot, and shouts into the wings. All right, we know you're in there. Come out talking. We have no control. None at all. He paces. Whatever became of the moment when one first knew about death, there must have been one, a moment in childhood when it first occurred to you that you don't go on forever. It must have been shattering, stamped into one's memory, and yet I can't remember it. It never occurred to me at all. What does one make of that? We must be born with an intuition of mortality. Before we know the words for it, before we know that there are words, out we come, bloodied and squalling with the knowledge that for all the compasses in the world, there's only one direction and time is its only measure. A Hindu, a Buddhist, and a lion tamer chance to meet in a circus on the Indo-Chinese border. They're taking us for granted! Well, I won't stand for it. In future, notice will be taken! Kneeling to face Keep the wind. Keep out! I forbid anyone to enter! No one comes. That's better. Immediately behind him, a grand procession enters, principally Claudius, Gertrude, Polonius, and Ophelia. Claudius takes Roz's elbow as he passes and is immediately deep in conversation. The context is Shakespeare, Act 3, Scene 1. Gil still faces front as Claudius, Roz, etc. pass upstage in turn. Death followed by eternity. The worst of both worlds. It is a terrible thought. He turns upstage in time to take over the conversation with Claudius. Gertrude and Rouse head downstage. Did he receive you well? Most like a gentleman. And, but with much forcing of his disposition. A flat lie. Out of question, but of our demands most free in his reply. Did you say him to any pastime? Madam, it so fell out that certain players we o'er wrought on the way. Of these we told him, and there did seem in him a kind of joy to hear of it. They are here about the court, and as I think they have already ordered this night to play before him. Tis most true. And he beseeched me to entreat your majesties to hear and see the matter. With all my heart, and it doth content me to hear him so inclined. Good gentlemen, give him a further edge, and drive his purposes into these delights. We shall, my lord. Sweet Gertrude, leave us too, for we have closely sent for Hamlet hither, that he, as twere by accident, may hear affront Ophelia. Exunt Ophelia and Gertrude, uh, Claudius leading them out. A moment's peace, in and out, on and 
spin-off. They're coming at us from all sides. We're never satisfied. Catching us on the trot. Why can't we go by them? What's the difference? I'm going. Rouse pulls his cloak round him. Gil ignores him. Without confidence, Rouse heads upstage. He looks out and comes back quickly. He's coming. What's he doing? Nothing. He must be doing something. Walking. On his hands? No, on his feet. Dark naked. Fully dressed. Selling toffee apples. Not that I noticed. You could be wrong. I don't think so. I can't see for the life of me how we're going to get into conversation. Hamlet enters upstage and pauses, weighing up the pros and cons of making his quietus. Roz and Gil watch him. Nevertheless, I suppose one might say that this was a chance. One might, well, accost him. Yes, it definitely looks like a chance to me. Something on the lines of a direct, informal approach, man to man, straight from the shoulder. Now look here, what's it all about sort of thing? Yeah, yes, this looks like one to be grabbed with both hands, I should say, if I were asked. No point in looking at a gift horse till you see the whites of its eyes, etc. He moves towards Hamlet, but his nerve fails. He returns. We're overawed. That's our trouble. When it comes to the point, we succumb to their personality. Ophelia enters with prayer book, a religious procession of one. Good night. Four sins be all my sins remembered. She stopped for him, and he catches up with her. Good, my lord. How does your honor for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. They disappear, talking into the wing. It's like living in a public park. Very impressive. Yes, I thought your direct informal approach was going to stop this thing dead in its tracks there. If I may make a suggestion, shut up and sit down. Stop being perverse. I'm not gonna stand for it. A female figure, ostensibly the queen enters. Rouse marches up behind her puts his hands over her eyes, and says with a desperate frivolity, Guess who? Claire. Rouse lets go, spins round. He had been holding Alfred in his robe and blonde wig. The player is in the downstage corner still. Rouse comes down to that exit. The player does not budge. He and Rouse stand toe to toe. Excuse me. I beg your pardon. The player lifts his downstage foot. Roz bends to put his hand on the floor. The player lowers his foot. Roz screams and leaps away. What did he do? I put my foot down. My hand was on the floor! Put your hand under his foot? I... Put the floor. I thought... Don't leave me. He makes a break for an exit. A tragedian dressed as a king enters. Rouse recoils, breaks for the opposite wing. Two cloaked tragedians enter. Rouse tries again, but another tragedian enters, and Rouse retires to midstage. The player claps his hands matter of factly. Right. We haven't got too much time. What are you doing? Dress rehearsal. Now, if you two wouldn't mind just. Moving back, there, good. Everyone ready? And for goodness sake, remember what we're doing. We always use the same costumes, more or less, and they forget what they're supposed to be 
in, you see. Stop, stop picking your nose, Alfred. When queens have to do it by a cerebral process passed down in the blood. Good. Silence. Off we go. Full times, 30. Hath Phoebus's cart? No, no, no. Dumb show first, your confounded majesty. So they're a bit out of practice, but they always pick up wonderfully for the debts. It brings out the poetry in them. Oh, nice. There's nothing more unconvincing than an unconvincing death. I'm sure. Act one moves now. The mime. Soft music from a recorder. Player king and player queen embrace. She <laughs> kneels and makes a show of protestation to him. He takes her up, declining his head upon her neck. He lies down. She, seeing him asleep, leaves him. What is the dumb show for? Well, it's a device, really. It makes the action that follows more or less comprehensible. You understand, we are tied down to a language which makes up in obscurity what it lacks in style. The mime continued. Enter another. He takes off the sleeper's crown, kisses it. He had brought in a small bottle of liquid. He pours the poison in the sleeper's ear and leaves him. The sleeper convulses heroically, dying. Who was that? The king's brother and uncle to the prince. <clears throat> it was a little caught up there. Not exactly fraternal. <laughs> Uh, not exactly avun avuncular as time goes on. The queen returns, makes passionate action, finding the king dead. The poisoner comes in again, attended by two others, the two in cloaks. The poisoner seems to console with her. The dead body is carried away. The poisoner woos the queen with gifts. She seems harsh a while, but in the end accepts his love. End of mime, at which point... The wail of a woman in torment and Ophelia appears, wailing, closely followed by Hamlet in a hysterical state, shouting at her, circling her both midstage. Go oh, to all no more on it. It has made me mad. She falls on her knees, weeping. I say we will have no more marriage. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. To a nunnery. Go. He goes out. Ophelia falls on her knees upstage, her sobs barely audible. A slight silence. Full thirty times hath Phoebus's cart. Claudius enters with Polonius and goes over to Ophelia and lifts her to her feet. The tragedians jump back with heads inclined. Love his affections do not that way tend, or what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. There's something in his soul or which his melancholy sits on brood, and I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger for which to prevent I have in quick determination thus set it down. He shall with speed to England which carries the three of them, Claudius, Polonius, Ophelia, out of sight. The player moves, clapping his hands for attention. Gentlemen, it doesn't seem to be coming. We are not getting it at all. What did you think? What was I supposed to think? You're not getting across. Rouse returns. That that didn't look like love to me. Things can stretch again. It was a mess. It's going to be chaos on the night. Exactly. We're spectators. Act two. Positions. Wasn't that the end? Do you call that an ending? With practically everyone on his feet? <laughs> My goodness, no. Over your dead body. <laughs> How am I supposed to take that? 
lying down. <laughs> there is a design at work in all art. Surely you know that. Events must play themselves out to aesthetic, moral, and logical conclusion. And what's that in this case? It never varies. We aim at the point where everyone who is marked for death dies. Marked? Between just deserts and tragic irony, we are given quite a lot of scope for a particular talent. Generally speaking, things have gone about as far as they can possibly go when things have gone about as bad as they reasonably get. Who decides? Decides. It is written. He turns away and Gil grabs him and spins him back violently, unflustered. Now, if you're going to be subtle, we'll miss each other in the dark. I'm referring to oral tradition, so to speak. Gil releases him. <clears throat> We're tragedians, you see. We follow directions. There is no choice at all. The bad end unhappily, the good unluckily. That is what tragedy means. Positions! The tragedians have taken up positions for the continuation of the mime, which in this case means a love scene, sexual and passionate, between the queen and the poisoner slash king. Go! The lovers begin. The player contributes a breathless commentary for Ross and Gill. Having murdered his brother and wooed the widow, the poisoner mounts the throne. Here we see him and his queen give rein to their unbridled passion. She little knowing that the man she holds in her arms. Oh, I say here, really, you can't do that. Why not? Well, really, I mean, people want to be entertained. They don't come expecting sordid and gratuitous filth. You're wrong. They do. Murder, seduction, incest. What do you want, jokes? I want a good story with a beginning, middle, and end. And you? I prefer art to mirror life, if it's all the same to you. It's all the same to me, sir. All, all, all right, no, no need to indulge yourselves. I come on in a minute. Lucianus, nephew to the king, next. They disport themselves to accommodate the next piece of mime, which consists of the player himself exhibiting an excitable anguish, choreographed and stylized, leading to an impassioned scene with the queen, the closet scene, Shakespeare, Act 3, Scene 4, and a very stylized reconstruction of a Polonius figure being stabbed behind the heiress, the murdered king to stand in for Polonius, while the player himself continues his breathless commentary for the benefit of Roz and Gill. Lucianus, nephew to the king, usurped by his uncle and shattered by his mother's incestuous marriage, loses his reason, throwing the court into turmoil and disarray as he alternates between bitter melancholy and unrestricted lunacy, staggering from the suicidal to the homicidal. He at last confronts his mother and in a scene of provocative ambiguity, begs her to repent and recant. The king, tormented by guilt, haunted by fear, decides to dispatch his nephew to England and entrusts his this undertaking to two smiling accomplices, friends, courtiers, or two spies. He swung round to bring together the poisoner king and the two cloaked tragedians. The latter kneel and accept a scroll from the king. Giving them a letter to present to the English court, and so, they depart on board ship. The two spies position themselves on either side of the player, and the three of them sway gently in unison, the motion of a boat. And then the player detaches himself. And they arrive. One spy shades his eyes of the horizon. And disembark. And present themselves before the English king. He wheels round. The English king. An exchange of headgear, headgear creates the English king from the remaining player. That is the player who played the original murdered king. But where is the prince? Where indeed? 
The plot has thickened. A twist of fate and cunning has put into their hands a letter that seals their depths. The two spies present their letter. The English king reads it and orders their deaths. They stand up as the player whips off their cloaks preparatory to execution. Traitors hoist by their own pattern or victims of the gods we shall never know. The whole mime has been fluid and continuous, but now Rouse moves forward and brings it to a pause. What brings Rouse forward is the fact that under their cloaks, the two spies are wearing coats identical to those worn by Rouse and Gill, whose coats are now covered by their cloaks. Rouse approaches his spy doubtfully. He does not quite understand why the coats are familiar. Rouse stands close, touches the coat thoughtfully. Well, if it isn't... No, wait a minute, don't, don't tell me. It's a long time since... Oh, where was it? Oh, this is taking me back to... When was it? I know, don't I? I never forget a face. Not that I know yours, that is. For a moment, I thought... No, I don't know you, do I? Yes, I'm afraid you're quite wrong. You must have mistaken me for someone else. Gil, meanwhile, has approached the other spy, brow creased in thought. Are you familiar with this play? No. <laughs> A slaughterhouse. Eight corpses, all told. It brings out the best in us. You. What do you know about death? It's what actors do best. They have to exploit whatever talent is given to them and their talent is dying. They can die heroically, comically, ironically, slowly, suddenly, dis disgustingly, charmingly, or from a great height. My own talent is more general. I extract significance from melodrama, a significance which it does not in fact contain. But occasionally, from out of this matter, there escapes a beam of light that, seen at the right angle, can crack the shell of mortality. Is that all they can do? Die? No, no! They kill beautifully. In fact, some of them kill even better than they die. The rest die better than they kill. They're, they're a team. Which ones are which? There's not much in it. Actors! The mechanics of cheap melodrama, that, that isn't death! You scream and choke and sink to your knees, but it doesn't bring death home to anyone. You didn't catch them unawares and start the whisper in their skulls that says, one day you are going to die. You die so many times. How can you expect them to believe in your death? On the contrary, it's the only kind they do believe. They're conditioned to it. I had an actor once who was condemned to hang for stealing a sheep uh, or a lamb, I forget which. So I got permission to have him hanged in the middle of a play. I had to change the plot a bit, but I thought it would be effective, you know, and you wouldn't believe it. He just wasn't convincing. It was impossible to suspend one's disbelief. And what, with the audience jeering and throwing peanuts, the whole thing was a disaster. He did nothing but cry all the time, right out of character. Just stood there and cried. Never again. In good humor, he has already turned back to the mime. The two spies awaiting execution at the hands of the player. Audiences know what to expect. And that is all that they are prepared to believe in. Show. The spies die at some length, rather well. The light has begun to go, and it fades as they die, and as Gil speaks. No, 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 you've got it all wrong. You can't act death. The fact of it is nothing to do with seeing it happen. It's not gasps and blood and falling about. That isn't what makes it death. It's just a man failing to reappear, that's all. Now you see him, now you don't. That's the, the only thing that's real. Here one minute and gone the next and never coming back. An exit, unobtrusive and unannounced, 
a disappearance gathering weight as it goes on until finally it is heavy with death. The two spies lie still, barely visible. The player comes forward and throws the spies' cloaks over their bodies. Roz starts to clap slowly. Blackout. A second of silence, then much noise. Shouts. The king rises, give o'er the play, and cries for lights, lights, lights. When the lights comes, after a few seconds, it comes as a sunrise. The stage is empty save for two cloaked figures sprawled on the ground in the approximate positions last held by the dead spies. As the light grows, they are seen to be Roz and Gil and to be resting quite comfortably. Roz raises himself to his elbows and shades his eyes as he stares into the auditorium. Finally. That must be East then. I think I can assume that. I'm assuming nothing. No, it's all right. That's the sun. East. Where? I watched it come up. No. There was light all the time, you see, and you opened your eyes very, very slowly. If you'd been facing back there, you'd be swearing that was the East. You're a mass of prejudice. I've been taken in before. Rings a bell. We're waiting to see what we're going to do. Good old East. As soon as we make a move, they'll come pouring in from every side, shouting obscure instructions, confusing us with ridiculous remarks, messing us about from here to breakfast and getting our names wrong. Raul starts to protest, but he has hardly opened his mouth before. Oh. Gildenstern. Gil is still prone. You're wanted. Gil furiously leaps to his feet as Claudius and Gertrude enter. They're in some desperation. Friends, both. Goy, join you with some further aid. Hamlet in madness hath Polonius slain, and from his mother's closet hath dragged him. Go, seek him out. Speak fair and bring the body into the chapel. I pray you haste in this. Come, Gertrude. We'll call up our wisest friends and let them know both what we mean to do. They've gone. Roz and Gil remain quite still. Well, quite. Well, well. Quite, quite. Seek him out, etc. Right. Well, well, that's a step in the right direction. You didn't like him? Who? Oh. God, I hope more tears are shed for us. Well, it's progress, isn't it? Something positive? Seek him out. He looks around without moving his feet. Where does one begin? He takes one step towards the wing and halts. Well, that's a step in the right direction. You think so? He could be anywhere. All right. You go that way, I'll go this way. Right. They walk towards opposite wings. Rouse halts. No. Gil halts. You go this way, I'll go that way. All right. They march towards each other. Cross. Rouse halts. Wait a minute. Gil halts. I think we should stick together. He might be violent. Good point. I'll come with you. Gil marches across to Roz. They turn to leave. Roz halts. No, I'll come with you. Right. They turn, march across to the opposite wing. Roz halts. Gil halts. I'll come with you my way. All right. They turn again and march across. Roz halts. Gil halts. I just thought if we both go, he could come here. That would be stupid, wouldn't it? All right. I'll stay. You go. 
Right. Gil marches to mid-stage. I say. Gil wheels and carries on marching back towards Roz, who starts marching downstage. They cross. Roz halts. I've just thought. Gil halts. We ought to stick together. He might be violent. Good point. Gil marches down to join Roz. They stand still for a moment in their original positions. Well, at least we're getting somewhere. Of course, he might not come. No, he'll come. We have some explaining to do. He'll come. Airily wanders upstage. Don't worry. Take my word for it. He looks out and is appalled. He's coming. What's he doing? Walking. Alone? No. Who's with him? The old man. Walking? No. Not walking? No. Ah, that's an opening if ever there was one. <laughs> let him walk into the trap. What trap? You stand there. Don't let him pass. He positions Roz with his back to one wing, facing Hamlet's entrance. Gil positions himself next to Roz a few feet away, so that they are covering one side of the stage, facing the opposite side. Gil unfastens his belt, and Roz does the same. They join the two belts and hold them taut between them. Roz's trousers slide slowly down. Hamlet enters opposite, slowly dragging Polonius's body. He enters upstage, makes a small arc, and leaves by the same side a few feet downstage. Roz and Gil, holding the belts taut, stare at him in some bewilderment. Bewilderment. Hamlet leaves, dragging the body. They relax the strain on the belts. That was close. The limit to what two people can do. They undo the belts and Roz pulls up his trousers. Worried? He, he was Fuck. dead. Of course he's dead. Properly. Death, death, isn't it? Perhaps he'll come back this way. Roz starts to take off his belt. No, 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 no. If we can't learn by experience, what else have we got? Rouse desists. Give him a shout. I thought we'd been into all that. Hamlet! Absurd. Lord Hamlet! Hamlet enters, and Rouse is a little dismayed. What have you done, my lord, with the dead body? You pounded it with the dust. Where to tis kin. Tell us where tis that we may take it thence and bear it to the chapel. Do not believe it. Believe what? That I can keep your counsel and not mine own. Besides, to be demanded of a sponge, what replication should be made by the son of a king? Take you me for a sponge, my lord? I, sir, that soaks up the king's countenance his rewards, his authorities. But such officers do the king best service in the end. He keeps them like an ape in the corner of his jaw, first mouthed to be last swallowed. When he needs what you have gleaned, it is but a squeezing you. And sponge, you shall be dry again. I understand you not, my lord. I am glad of it. A knavish speech sleeps in a foolish ear. My lord, you must tell us where the body is and go with us to the king. He is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is a thing. A thing, my lord? Of nothing. Bring me to him. Hamlet moves resolutely towards one wing. They move with him, shepherding. Just before they reach the exit, Hamlet, apparently seeing Claudius approaching from offstage, bends low in a sweeping bow. Roz and Gil, cued by Hamlet, also bow deeply. A sweeping ceremonial bow with their cloaks swept round them. 
Hamlet, however, continues the movement into an about turn and walks off in the opposite direction. Ross and Gil, with their heads low, do not notice. No one comes on. Ross and Gil squint upwards and find they are bowing to nothing. Claudius enters behind them. At his first words, they leap up and do a double take. Oh, what has befallen? Uh, uh, where the body is bestowed, my lord, we cannot get from him. But where is he? Without, my lord, guarded to know your pleasure. Bring him before us. This hits Rawls between the eyes, but only his eyes show it. Again, his hesitation is fractional, and then with great deliberation, he turns to Gil. Hope. Bring in the Lord. Again, there's a fractional moment in which Roz is smug, Gil is trapped and betrayed. Gil opens his mouth and closes it. The situation is saved. Hamlet, escorted, is marched in just as Claudius leaves. Hamlet and his escort cross the stage and go out following Claudius. Lighting changes to exterior. All right then. Does not move thoughtfully. And yet it doesn't seem enough to have breathed such significance. Can that be all? And why us? Anybody would have done. And we have contributed nothing. It was a trying episode while it lasted, but they've done with us now. From what? I don't pretend to have understood. Frankly, I'm not very interested. If they won't tell us, that's their affair. He wanders upstage to the exit. For my part, I'm only glad that there's the last we've seen of him. And he glances off stage and turns front, his face betraying the fact that Hamlet is there. I knew it wasn't the end. What else? We're taking him to England. What's he doing? Roz goes upstage and then returns. Talking. To himself? Ross makes to go, but Gil cuts him off. Is he alone? No, he's with a soldier. Then he's not talking to himself, is he? Not by himself. Should we go? Where? Anywhere. Why? Ross puts up his head, listening. There it is again. All I ask is a change in ground. We must this day on our daily round. Hamlet enters behind them, talking with a soldier in arms. Rouse and Gil don't look round. They'll have us hanging about till we're dead. At least. And the weather will change. The spring can't last forever. But sir, whose powers are these? They are of Norway, sir. How purpose, sir, I pray you? Against some part of Poland. Who commands them, sir? The nephew of old Norway, Fortinbras. We'll be cold. The summer won't last. But come, no. Rosal no examines the ground. No leaves. But come, no. Nothing to do with leaves. It is to do with a certain brownness at the edges of the day. Brown is creeping up on us. Take my word for it. Russets and tangerine shades of old gold flushing the very outside edge of the senses. Deep shining ochres, burnt umber and parchments of baked earth reflecting on itself and through itself, filtering the light. At such times, perhaps coincidentally, the leaves might fall somewhere by repute. Yesterday was blue, like smoke. Ross has his head up, listening. I got it again then. They listen. Faintest sound of the tragedian's band. I humbly thank you, sir. God by you, sir. Soldier exits. Rouse gets up quickly and goes to Hamlet. Will it please you go, my lord? I'll be with you straight. Go you a little before. Hamlet turns to face upstage. Rouse returns down. Gil faces front and doesn't turn. Is he there? Yes. What are you doing? Roz looks over his shoulder. Talking. To himself. Yes. Pause, and then he makes the leave. 
He said we can go. Cross my heart. I like to know where I am. Even if I don't know where I am, I like to know that. If we go, there's no knowing. No knowing what? If we'll ever come back. We don't want to come back. That may very well be true, but do we want to go? We'll be free. I don't know. It's the same sky. We've come this far. Rouse moves toward the exit. Gil follows him. And besides, anything could happen yet. They go. Blackout. Act three opens in pitch darkness. Soft sea sounds. After several seconds of nothing, a voice from the dark. Are you there? Where? Flying start. Is that you? Yes. How do you know? Oh, for God's sake. We're not finished then. Well, we're here, aren't we? Are we? I can't see a thing. You can still think, can't you? I think so. You can still talk? What should I say? Don't bother. You can feel, can't you? Ah! There's life in me yet. What are you feeling? A leg. Yeah. It feels like my leg. How does it feel? Dead. Dead? I can't feel a thing. Give it a pinch. Ah! Sorry. That's cleared up. Longer pause. The sound builds a little and identifies itself. The sea. Ship timbers, wind in the rigging, and then shouts of sailors calling obscure but inescapably nautical instructions from all directions far and near. A short list. Hard to larboard! Reef down me hearties! Hard aboard! All the way lads! Fly the jib tops up me mateys! Well, the point has been made, and there are more. We're on a boat. Dark, isn't it? Not for night. No, not for night. Dark for day. Well, yes, it's dark for day. We must have gone north, of course. Off course? Land of the midnight sun, that is. Of course. Some sailor sounds. Ahoy! A lantern is lit upstage, in fact, by Hamlet. The stage lightens disproportionately, enough to see Rouse and Gill sitting downstage. Vague shapes of rigging, etc. behind. I think it's getting light. Not the night. This far north. Unless we're off course. Of course. A better light. Lantern? Moon? Light. Revealing, among other things, three large man-sized casks on deck, appended with lids. Spaced but in line. Behind and above, a gaudy striped umbrella on a pole stuck into the deck, tilted so that we do not see behind it. One of those huge six-foot diameter jobs. Still dim upstage. Rosengill still facing front. Yes, it's lighter than it was. It'll be night soon. This far north. I suppose we'll have to go to sleep. Tired? No. I don't think I'd take to it. Sleep all night, can't see a thing all day. Those Eskimos must have had a quiet life. Where? What? I thought you... <laughs> I've lost all capacity for disbelief. I'm not sure that I could even rise to a little gentle skepticism. Well, should we stretch our legs? I don't feel like stretching my legs. I'll stretch them for you, if you like. No. We could stretch each other's. That way we wouldn't have to go anywhere. 
No, somebody might come in. In where? Out here. In out here? On deck. Roz considers the floor and slaps it. Nice bit of planking, that. Yes, I'm very fond of boats myself. I like the way they're contained. You don't have to worry about which way to go or whether to go at all. The question doesn't arise because you're on a boat, are you? Are, the, the question doesn't arise because you're on a boat, aren't you? Boats are safe areas in the game of tag. The players will hold their positions until the music starts. I think I'll spend most of my life on boats. Very healthy. Ross inhales with expectation, exhales with boredom. Gil stands up and looks over the audience. One is free on a boat for a time, relatively. What's it like? Rough. Rouse joins him. And they look out over the audience. I think I'm going to be sick. Gil looks a finger, holds it up experimentally. I'll be shy, I think. Ross goes upstage, ideally a sort of upper deck joined to the downstage lower deck by short steps, the umbrella being on the upper deck. Ross pauses by the umbrella and looks behind it. Gil, meanwhile, has been resuming his own theme, looking out over the audience. Read, move, speak, extemporize, and yet we have not been cut loose. Our truancy is defined by one fixed star, and our drift represents merely a slight change of angle to it. We may seize the moment, toss it around while the moments pass, a short dash here, an exploration there, but we are brought round full circle to face again the single immutable fact that we, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, bearing a letter from one king to another, are taking Hamlet to England. By which time, Roz's returned, tiptoeing with great import, teeth clenched for secrecy. Gets to Gil, points surreptitiously behind him in a tight whisper. I say, he's there. What's he doing? Sleeping. It's all right for him. What is? He can sleep. It's all right for him. He's got us now. He can sleep. It's all done for him. He's got us. And we've done nothing. All I ask is our common due. For those in peril on the sea. Give us this day our daily cue. Long pause. After shifting, looking around. What now? What do you mean? Well, nothing is happening. We're on a boat. I'm aware of that. Then what do you expect? We act on scraps of information, sifting half-remembered directions that we can hardly separate from instinct. Ross puts a hand into his purse, then both hands behind his back, then holds his fist out. Gil taps one fist. Rouse opens it to show a coin. He gives it to Guildenstern. He puts his hand back into his purse, then both hands behind his back, then holds his fists out. Gil taps one. Rouse opens it to show a coin. He gives it to Gil. Repeat, repeat. Gil getting tense, desperate to lose. Repeat. Gil taps a hand, changes his mind, taps the other, and Rawls inadvertently reveals that he has a coin in both fists. You had money in both hands. Yes. Every time? Yes. What's the point of that? I wanted to make you happy. How much did he give you? Who? 
The king. He gave us the money. How much did he give you? I asked you first. I got the same as you. He wouldn't discriminate between us. How much did you get? The same. How do you know? You just told me. How do you know? He wouldn't discriminate between us. Even if he could. Which he never could. He couldn't even be sure of mixing us up. Without mixing us up. Why don't you say something original? No wonder the whole thing is so stagnant. You don't take me up on anything. You just repeat it in a different order. I can't think of anything original. I'm only good in support. I'm sick of making the running. It must be your dominant personality. Ugh. What's going to become of us? Bill comforts him. All harshness gone. Don't, don't cry. All right. Damn. Yeah. Empty world. But we've got nothing to go on. We're out on our own. We're on our way to England. We're taking Hamlet there. What for? What for? Where have you been? When? We won't know what to do when we get there. We take him to the king. Will he be there? No, the king of England. He's expecting us? No. He won't know what we're playing at. What are we going to say? We've got a letter. You remember the letter. Do I? Everything is explained in the letter. We count on that. Is that it then? What? We take Hamlet to the English king. We hand over the letter. What then? There may be something in the letter to keep us going a bit. And if not? Then that's it. We're finished. At a loose end? Yes. Are there likely to be loose ends? Who's the English king? It depends on when we get there. What do you think it says? Oh, greetings. Expressions of loyalty. Asking of favors, calling in debts. Obscure promises balanced by vague threats. Diplomacy. Regards to the family. And what about Hamlet? Oh, yeah. And us? The full background? I should say so. So we've got a letter which explains everything. You've got it. Rouse takes that literally and starts to pat his pockets, etc. What's the matter? The letter? Have you got it? Have I? But where would I have put it? You can't have lost it. I must have. Lord. I thought he gave it to me. Russ looks at him hopefully. Perhaps he did. But you seemed so sure it was you who hadn't got it. It was me who hadn't got it! But if he gave it to me, there's no reason why you should have had it in the first place. In which case, I don't see what all the fuss is about you not having it. I admit it's confusing. This is oh, getting rather undisciplined. The boat, the night, the sense of isolation and uncertainty. All these induce the loosening of the concentration. We must not lose control. Tighten up. Now, either you have lost the letter or you didn't have it to lose in the first place, in which case the king never gave it to you, in which case he gave it to me, in which case I would have put it into my inside top pocket, in which case it will be me. Here. <laughs> we mustn't drop off like that again. Riles takes the letter gently from him. Now that we have found it, why were we looking for it? We thought it was lost. Something else? No. Deflation. Now we've lost attention. What tension? What was the last thing I said before we wandered off? What was that? I can't remember. 
What a shambles. We're just not getting anywhere. Not even England. I don't believe in it anyway. What? England. Just a conspiracy of cartographers, you mean? I mean, I don't believe it. I have no image. I try to picture us arriving. A little harbor, perhaps? Roads? Inhabitants to point the way? Horses on the road riding for a day or a fortnight and then a palace and the English king? That would be the logical kind of thing. But my mind remains a blank. No. We're slipping off the map. Yes. Yes. You don't believe anything till it happens. As it has all happened, hasn't it? We drift down time, clutching at straws. But what good's a brick to a drowning man? Don't give up. We can't be long now. We might as well be dead. Do you think death could possibly be a boat? No, no, no. Death is not. Death isn't. You take my meaning. Death is the ultimate negative. Not being. You can't not be on a boat. I've frequently not been on boats. No, 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 no. What you've been is not on boats. I wish I was dead. Considering the drop, I could jump over the side. That would put a spoke in their wheel. Unless they're counting on it. I shall remain on board. That'll put a spoke in their wheel. The futility of it, Fury. All right. We don't question. We don't doubt. We perform. But a line must be drawn somewhere, and I would like to put it on record that I have no confidence in England. Thank you! And even if it's true, it'll be another shambles. I don't see why. He won't know what we're talking about. What are we going to say? We say, Your Majesty, we have arrived. And Ross, who are you? We are Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Never heard of you! Well, we're nobody special. What's your game? We've got our instructions. First, I've heard of it. Let me finish. <clears throat> we come from Denmark. What do you want? Nothing. We're delivering Hamlet. Who's he? You've heard of Ham. Oh, I've heard of him, all right, and I want nothing to do with him. But you, you march in here without so much as a buy or leave and expect me to take every lunatic you try to pass off with a lot of unsubstantiated. We've got a letter. Roz snatches it and tears it open. I see. I see. Well, this seems to support your story such as it is. It is an exact command from the King of Denmark for several different reasons, importing Denmark's health and England's too, that on the reading of this letter without delay, I should have Hamlet's head cut off. Gil snatches the letter. Rouse double taking snatches it back. Gil snatches it back. They read it together and separate. Pause. They are well downstage, looking front. The sun's going down. It'll be dark soon. You think so? I was just making conversation. We're his friends. How do you know? From our young days, brought up with him. We've only got their word for it. But that's what we depend on. No, yes. And then again, no. Let us keep things in proportion. Assume, if you like, that they're going to kill him. Well, he is a man, he is mortal, death comes to us all, etc. And consequently, he would have died anyway, sooner or later. Or to look at it from the social point of view, He's just one man among many. The loss would be well within reason and convenience. And then again, what is so terrible about death? 
as Socrates so philosophically put it, since we don't know what death is, it is illogical to fear it. It might be very nice. Certainly it is a release from the burden of life and for the godly, a haven and a reward. Or to look at it another way, we are little men. We don't know the ins and outs of the matter. There are wheels within wheels, etc. It would be presumptuous of us to interfere with the design of fate or, or even of kings. All in all, I think we'd be well advised to leave well alone. Tie up the letter. There, neatly, like that. They won't notice the broken seal, assuming you were in character. But what's the point? Don't apply logic. He's done nothing to us. Or justice. It's awful. But it could have been worse. I was beginning to think it was. <laughs> His relief comes out as a laugh. Behind them, Hamlet appears from behind the umbrella. The light has been going, slightly. Hamlet is going to the lantern. The position as I see it then. We, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, from our young days brought up with him, awakened by a man standing on his saddle, are summoned and arrive, and are instructed to glean what afflicts him and draw him on to pleasures such as a play, which unfortunately, as it turns out, is abandoned in some confusion owing to certain nuances outside our appreciation, which among other causes results in, among other effects, a high, not to say homicidal, excitement in Hamlet, whom we, in consequence, are escorting for his own good to England. Good. We're on top of it now. Hamlet blows out the lantern. The stage goes pitch black. The black resolves itself to moonlight, by which Hamlet approaches the sleeping Roz and Gill. He extracts the letter and takes it behind his umbrella. The light of his lantern shines through the fabric. Hamlet emerges again with a letter and replaces it and retires, blowing out his lantern. Morning comes. Rouse watches it coming. Behind him is a gay sight beneath the retilted umbrella reclining in a desk chair, wrapped in a rug, reading a book, possibly smoking, sits Hamlet. Rouse watches the morning come and brighten to a high noon. I'm assuming nothing. The position as I see it then. That's west, unless we are off course, in which case it's night. The king gave me the same as you. The king gave you the same as me. The king never gave me the letter. The king gave you the letter. We don't know what's in the letter. We take Hamlet to the English king, it, depending on when we get there, who he is, and we hand over the letter, which may or may not have something in it to keep us going. And if not, we are finished and at a loose end. We could have done worse. I don't think we missed any chances. Not that we're getting much help. He sits down again, and they lie down, prone. If we stopped breathing, we vanish. The muffled sound of a recorder. They sit up with disproportionate interest. Here we go. Yes, but what? They listen to the music. Out of the void, finally, a sound. While on a boat, Admittedly, outside of the action, admittedly, the perfect and absolute silence of the wet, lazy slap of water against water and the rolling creak of timber breaks, giving rise at once to the speculation of the assumption or the assumption or the hope that something is about to happen. A pipe is heard. One of the sailors has pursed his lips against a woodwind, his fingers and thumb governing, uh, shall we say, the vintages whereupon giving it breath, let us say, with his mouth, it's the pipe discourses, as the saying goes, most eloquent music. A thing like that, it could change the course of events. Go see what, go and see what it is. 
It's someone playing on a pipe. Go and find him. And then what? I don't know. Request a tune. What for? Quick, before we lose our momentum. Why? Something is happening. It had quite escaped my attention. He listens and then makes a stab at an exit. He listens more carefully, changes direction. Gil takes no notice. Roz wanders about trying to decide where the music comes from. Finally, he tracks it down unwillingly to the middle barrel. There is no getting away from it. He turns to Gil who takes no notice. Roz during this whole business never quite breaks into articulate speech. His face and his hands indicate his incredulity, and he stands gazing at the middle barrel. The pipe plays on within. He kicks the barrel. The pipe stops. He leaps back towards Gil. The pipe starts up again. He approaches the barrel cautiously. He lifts the lid. The music is louder. He slams down the lid. The music is softer. He goes back towards Gil. But a drum starts. Muffled. He freezes. He turns. Considers the left hand barrel. The drumming goes on within, in time to the flute. He walks back to Gil. He opens his mouth to speak. Doesn't make it. A lute is heard. He spins round at the third barrel. More instruments join in. Until it is quite inescapable that inside the three barrels distributed, playing together a familiar tune which has been heard three times before, are the Tragedians. They play on. Ross sits beside Gil. They stare ahead. The tune has come to an end. Pause. I thought I heard a band. Plausibility is all I presume. Hold it up to stay on our daily tune. The lid of the middle barrel flies open and the player's head pops out. Uh -huh. All in the same boat, man. Everybody out. Impossibly, the tragedians climb out of their barrels with their instruments, but not their cart. A few bundles, except Alfred. The player is cheerful to Roz. Where are we? Traveling. Of course. We haven't gotten there yet. Are we all right for England? You look all right to me. I don't think they're very particular in England. Alfred! Alfred emerges from the player's barrel. What are you doing here? Just traveling. Right. Blend into the background. The tragedians are in costume from the mime. A king with a crown. Alfred is queen. The poisoner and the two cloaked figures. They blend. To Gil. Great to see us. You've come out of it very well so far. And you? In this favor, our play offended the king. Yes. Well, he's a second husband himself. Tactless, really. It was quite a good play, nevertheless. We never really got going. It was getting quite interesting when they stopped us. He looks up at Hamlet. That's the way to travel. What were you doing in there? Hiding. Indicating costumes. We uh, had to run for it, just as we were. Stowaways. Naturally. Uh, we didn't get paid, owing to circumstances ever so slightly beyond our control, and all the money we had, we lost betting on certainties. Life is a gamble at terrible odds. If it was, 
a bet you wouldn't take it. You know that any number doubled is even. Is it? We learn something every day through our thoughts. What? We troopers just go on and on. Do you know what happens to all that? What? Nothing. You're still acting. Surprise, then. What? Surprise to see us. I knew it wasn't the end. With practically everyone on its feet, what do you make of it so far? We haven't got much to go on. No. It's possible. But it wouldn't make any difference. But it's possible. Pointless. It's allowed. Allowed, yes. We are not restricted. No boundaries have been defined, no inhibitions imposed. We have, for the while, secured or blundered into our release for the while. Spontaneity and whim are the order of the day. Other wheels are turning, but they are not our concern. We can breathe. We can relax. We can do what we like and say what we like to whomever we like without restriction. Within limits, of course. Certainly within limits. Hamlet comes down to footlights and regards the audience. The others watch but don't speak. Hamlet clears his throat noisily and spits into the audience. A split second later, he claps his hand to his eye and wipes himself. He goes back upstage. A compulsion towards philosophical introspection is his chief characteristic, if I may put it like that. It does not mean he is mad. It does not mean he isn't. Very often, it does not mean anything at all, which may or may not be a kind of madness. It really boils down to symptoms. Pregnant replies, mystic allusions, mistaken identities, arguing his father is his mother, that sort of thing. Intimations of suicide, foregoing of exercise, loss of mirth, hints of claustrophobia, not to say delusions of imprisonment. Invocations of camels, chameleons, capons, whales, weasels, hawks, handsaws, riddles, quibbles, and evasions, amnesia, paranoia, myopia, daydreaming, hallucinations, stabbing his elders, abusing his parents, insulting his lover, and appearing hapless in public. Knock-kneed, drooped, stockinged, and sighing like a lovesick schoolboy, which at his age is coming on a bit strong. And talking to himself. And talking to himself. Rouse and Gil move apart together. Well, where is that got us? He's the player. The play offended the king. Offended the king. He orders his arrest. He orders his arrest. So he escapes to England. On the boat to which he meets. Gildenstern and Rosencrantz taking Hamlet. Who also offended the king. And killed Polonius. Offended the king in a variety of ways. To England. That seems to be it. Ross jumps up. Incidents! All we get is incidents. Dear God, is it too much to expect a little sustained action? And on the word, the pirates attack. That is to say, noise and shouts and rushing about. Pirates, pirates, pirates. Yeah. Everyone visible goes frantic. Hamlet draws his sword and rushes downstage. Gil, Roz, and the player draw swords and rush upstage. Collision. Hamlet turns back up. Then they turn back down. Collision. By which time there is general panic right upstage. All four charge upstage with Roz, Gil, and the player shouting. I'm lost. All four all four reach the top, see something they don't like, waver, run for their lives downstage. Hamlet in the lead leaps into the left barrel. The player leaps into the right barrel. Roz and Gil leap into the middle barrel, all closing the lids after them. The lights dim to nothing while the sound of fighting continues. Brah. The sound fades to nothing. The lights come up. The middle barrel with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern is missing. The lid of the right-handed barrel is raised cautiously. The heads of Roz and Gil appear. 
the lid of the other barrel, Hamlet's, is raised. The head of the player appears. All catch sight of each other and slam down their lids. Pause. The lids raise cautiously. They've gone. He starts to climb out. That was close. I've never thought quicker. They are all three out of barrels. Gil is wary and nervous. Roz is lighthearted, and the player is phlegmatic. They note the missing barrel. Roz looks round. Where's... The player takes off his hat in mourning. Once more. Alone. On our own resources. What do you mean? Where is he? Gone where? Yeah. You were dead lucky there, if that's the word I'm after. Dead? Lucky. Is he dead? Who knows? He's not coming back? Hardly. He's dead then. He's dead as far as we're concerned. Or we are as far as he is. He goes and sits on the floor to one side. Not too bad, is it? But but he can't. We're supposed to be. We've got a letter. We're going to England with a letter for the king. Yes, that much seems certain. I congratulate you on the unambiguity of your situation. But you don't understand. It contains. We, we had our instruction. The whole thing's pointless without him. Pirates could happen to anyone. Just deliver the letter. They'll send ambassadors from England to explain. Can't see the pirates left us home and high dry and home drunk. The pirates left us high and dry. There. Nothing will be resolved without him. There, there. We need Hamlet for our release. There. What are we supposed to do? He turns away, lies down if he likes. Rouse and Gill apart. Saved again. Saved for what? Rouse sighs. The sun's going down. It'll be night soon. If that's West. Shut up! I'm sick of it! Do you think conversation is going to help us now? I bet you all the money I've got the year of my birth doubled is an odd number. No. Your birth. He'll smashes him down. We've traveled too far and our momentum has taken over. We move idly towards eternity without possibility of reprieve or hope of explanation. Be happy. If you're not even happy, what's so good about surviving? We'll be all right. I suppose we just go on. Go where? To England. England? That's a dead end. I never believed in it anyway. All we've got to do is make our report and that'll be that, surely. I don't believe it. A shore, a harbor, say, and we get off and we stop someone and say, where's the king? And he says, oh, you follow that road there and take the first left and die, ah, don't believe any of it. Doesn't sound very plausible. And even if we came face to face, what do we say? We say, we've arrived. And who are you? We are Gildenstern and Rosencrantz. Which is which? Well, I'm... And you're... What's it all about? Well, we're bringing Hamlet. But then some pirates. I don't begin to understand. Who are these people? What's it got to do with me? You turn up out of the blue, you get some cock and bull story. We have a letter. Oh, a letter, yes. Bill snatches yes. it. That's true. That's something, a letter. Mm. 
as England is Denmark's faithful tributary, as love between them like the palm might flourish, etc. That on the knowing of this content, without delay of any kind, should those bearers, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, put to sudden death. He double takes. Rouse snatches the letter. Yell snatches it back. Rouse snatches it half back. You read it again and look up. The player gets to his feet and walks over to his barrel and kicks it and shouts into it. They've gone. It's all over. One by one, the players emerge, impossibly from the barrel, and form a casually menacing circle around Roz and Gil, who are still appalled and mesmerized. Whatever we went wrong was getting on a boat. We can move, of course, change direction, rattle about, but our movement is contained within a larger one that carries us along inexorably as the wind and current. They got it in for us, didn't they? Right from the beginning. Who would have thought that we were so important? Was it all for this? Who were we that so much should converge on our little death? Who are we? You are Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. That's enough. No, it is not enough to be told so little to such an end and still finally to be denied an explanation. In our experience, most things end in death. Your experience? Actors. He snatches a dagger from the player's belt and holds the point to the player's throat. The player backs and Gil advances, speaking more quietly. I'm talking about death and you've never experienced that, and you cannot act it. You die a thousand casual deaths with none of that intensity which squeezes out life, and no blood runs cold anywhere. Because even as you die, you know that you will come back in a different hat. But no one gets up after death. There is no applause. There is only silence and some secondhand clothes, and that's death. And he pushes the blade in up to the hilt. The player stands with huge, terrible eyes, clutching at the wound as the blade withdraws. He makes small weeping sounds and falls to his knees, and then right down. While he is dying, Gil, nervous, high almost, hysterical, wheels on the tragedians. If we have a destiny, then so had he. And if this is ours, then that was his. And if there are no explanations for us, then let there be none for him. The Tragedians watch the player die. They watch with some interest. And the player finally lies still. A short moment of silence. Then the Tragedians start to applaud with genuine admiration. The player stands up, brushing himself down. Oh, come. Come, gentlemen. No, no flattery. It was merely competent. The Tragedians are still congratulating him, and the player approaches Gil, who stands rooted, holding the dagger. What did you think? You see, it is the kind they do believe in. It's what is expected. He holds his hand out for the dagger. Gil slowly puts the point of the dagger onto the player's hand and pushes. The blade slides back into the handle. The player smiles, reclaims the dagger. For a moment, you thought I'd cheated. Rouse relieves his own tension with a loud, very nervy laugh. Oh, very good, very good. Took me in completely. Didn't he? Didn't he take you in completely? Encore! Encore! That's 
for all ages and occasions. That's by suspension, convulsion, consumption, incision, execution, asphyxiation, and malnutrition. Climatic, climatic carnage by poison and by steel. Double deaths by duel. Show! Alfred, still in his queen's costume, dies by poison. The player with rapier kills the king and duels with a fourth tragedian, inflicting and receiving a wound. The two remaining tragedians, the two spies dressed in the same coats as Rouse and Gill, are stabbed as before. And the light is fading over the deaths, which take place right upstage, dying amid the dying, tragically, romantically. Ah, uh, so there's an end to that. It's commonplace. Light goes with life. And in the winter of your years, dark comes early. Oh, not for us. Not like that. Dying is not romantic, and death is not a game which will soon be over. Death is not anything. Death is not. It's the absence of presence. Nothing more. The endless time of never coming back. A gap you can't see, and when the wind blows through it, it makes no sound. The light has gone upstage. Only Gil and Roz are visible as Roz's clapping falters to silence. Small pause. That's it then, is it? The sun's going down or the earth's coming up as the fashionable theory has it. Not that it makes any difference. What was it all about? When did it begin? Couldn't we just stay put? I mean, no one is gonna come on and drag us off. They'll just have to wait. We're still young, fit. We've got years. We've done nothing wrong. We didn't harm anyone. Did we? I can't remember. All right then, I don't care. I've had enough. To tell you the truth, I'm relieved. And he disappears from view. Gil does not notice. The name shouted in a certain dawn. A message, a summons. There must have been a moment at the beginning where we could have said no. But somehow we missed it. He looks round and sees Rosie. he is alone. Get. Mm. Well. You'll know better next time. <laughs> now you see me. Now you and disappears. Immediately, the whole stage is lit up, revealing upstage. Arranged in the approximate positions last held by the dead tragedians, the tableau of court and corpses, which is the last scene of Hamlet. That is, the king, queen, Laertes, and Hamlet all dead. Horatio holds Hamlet. Fortinbras is there. So are two ambassadors from England. The sight is dismal and our affairs from England come too late. The ears are senseless that should give us hearing to tell him his commandment is fulfilled, that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Where should we have our thanks? Not from his mouth had it the ability of life to thank you. He never gave commandment for their death. But since so jump upon this bloody question, you from the Polack Wars and you from England are here arrived, Give order that these bodies high on a stage be placed to view. And let me speak to the yet unknowing world of how these things came about. So shall you hear of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts of 
accidental judgments, casual slaughters, of deaths put on by cunning and forced cause. And in this upshot, purposes mistook fallen on the inventor's heads. All this can I truly deliver. But during the above speech, the play fades, overtaken by dark and music. <laughs>